Okay, class, welcome back to lecture. Again, this is Dr. Severin, and we're we'll going to be covering pulmonary function testing in this lecture. So I do want to comment on a few things. Uh, there are um, some differences between the type of test you'll see. So the most accurate method for assessing lung volumes and flow rate and the function of the lungs is a technique called plasmography, um, where the patient sits in a a device called a plasmograph. Now, plasmograph is you know any instrument for measuring changes in volume um, in an organ um, or whole body. Uh, so you can do a limb plasmograph for looking at blood flow changes. We can do this plasmograph chamber for looking at lung volume changes. This is the most accurate method for assessing residual volume, functional residual capacity, and total lung capacity because we have a known volume essentially in the chamber. We have a known volume for um, what the patient is kind of breathing out. So we can get a very accurate measure of what the, the volume then therefore is in you know remaining in the lungs after a normal breath which would be the functional residual capacity as well as the residual volume so when they completely breathe out so that's a plasmograph now that's really only reserved in pulmonology clinics you you know you may see a respiratory therapist um, you know working with these things pretty high tech you know the patient kind of walks into this airtight telephone booth so um, this is the most accurate method. It's more advanced technique. However, spirometry uh, is, is a pretty effective method for, for most purposes. Now, spirometry is a test that uses a spirometer. So it's a device that has a known, uh, it's calibrated to a known volume of air. Uh, so we can um, make inferences based off of flow rate. So typically um, what we do is we have a device uh, that we calibrate by pushing a volume of air across it so we can get you know an estimation of what volume and flow rate looks like and then we have the patient breathe um, af into that vice after it's been calibrated and we can measure the volume they expire as well as the rate um, by which they expire so we can get uh, pretty good measures for uh, vi uh, for our force vital capacity um, fev1 and all that peak expiratory flow which we'll get into later so the patient performs the test by fully inspiring and then fully expiring as full as they possibly can. And it's an effort-driven test. It's crucial that they take that full breath in and then that full breath out is as, as full as it is possible. Like, I mean, it's, you go almost to the point like you're almost wheezing. It's a, you know, every, every bit of it out as you can. Uh, the patient should be performing this test in standing with their nose clipped um, unless they're physically unable. There may be patients like in a wheelchair or have you know, different um, mobility limitations of some kind. And then the values of these tests are compared to normative values. And the most common one we see in adults is the NHANES-3 database. So uh, NHANES is a national database of various different um, health behaviors and stuff like that. So it's uh, normative data that's used for a lot of different things. We also use it for the um, spirometry test. Now, the values that we compare for lung volumes and flow rate are based on the individual's age, how old they are, because we know that, of course, changes lung compliance. So, you know, we don't want to compare someone who's 80 years old to values from someone who's 20 years old. I mean, there's going to be normal age-related changes in, you know, in lung volume and flow rate. Height um, and sex, uh, you know, if you're a taller individual, you're typically going to have a bigger you know, lung volume, you have bigger lungs, you're a bigger person. Same thing as well for um, sex. Typically men um, and women are a little bit different in size. So again, it's trying to match uh, value as much as we can. Uh, race and ethnicity are also included in the NHANES uh, database because um, they that's been shown to have some bit of an influence. But really the, the main, the main, 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 main factors are again, uh, age, height, and, um, and sex. Okay, so male versus female. So it's important to note that when we, you know, when we perform spirometry testing, it's really only indicated for people with dyspnea or a concern. Um, it's a diagnostic test. Again, it's not something that like we're probably going to do too much as PTs. Um, you may be asked to do it. It's not something that's going to drive a lot of your treatment interventions or decision making. It's a disease staging, um, you know, prognosis um, and diagnosis um, or diagnostic assessment. So it's, and it's typically reserved for patients with dyspnea 
um, and as you remember from our pathology and pathophysiology lectures, uh, there's a lot of conditions that have dyspnea. So this is part of the dyspnea assessment. In fact, if we look at the guidelines from the American Thoracic Society and European Respiratory Society, they do not recommend uh, spirometry testing or pulmonary function testing for people without dyspnea or out respiratory symptoms. Now, if you want to compare what your uh, normative values are, it's actually kind of fun. Um, you can go to this website here and plug in some of your data. So that's a, it's, a, it's, it's the CDC's website. Um, it actually runs you through how to perform the uh, spirometry test. So um, there are some questionnaires that patients will be asked. So I'm not going to go into too great a detail of this, but typically we want to make sure the patient's stable and will be able to tolerate the test. If they say yes to any of these things, uh, the test would be contraindicated just, again, to prevent any, any serious issues from the test because you are going to be breathing out pretty forcefully. Um, you want to make sure that um, nothing kind of you know, adverse occurs during that maneuver. Um, and these are examples of or these are examples of what a spirometry test would look like. Again, it's a little bit different than a plasm, uh, plasmography test. Uh, these are by uh, Mir. They're a great company. I've used them for um, multiple different uh, labs and stuff like that. Uh, there's also the Coco spirometer from Inspire Health. They're, they're similar similar devices. So these are some of the handheld. Um, spirometry devices or office-based devices that you might see. Again, we can get pretty good data from basic spirometry. Don't necessarily need to use a plasmography unless we want to get measurements of residual volume and FRC and our true measure of total lung capacity. So um, these are the values that we'll get from a spirometry test. Um, uh, well, total lung capacity typically we'll only get with a, um, you can make estimates from this, but typically that's going to get only be obtained from the um, plasmography. Um, vital capacity, tidal volume, we can also technically get if we wanted to just measure quiet breathing, minute ventilation, and again, residual volume is what you're gonna get um, from your um, plasmography. Uh, but these are values that we're gonna look at when we're assessing someone's lung function. So total lung capacity is the max amount of air contained at the lung at the end of a maximum inspiration. Like how much air can you hold into your lungs, okay? Vital capacity is how much air can you breathe out, right? Um, so that is performed after the maximum inspiration. They breathe out. Usually it's a force maneuver, so you may see this interchange, vital capacity, force vital capacity, FVC is what's done uh, most often when we're doing that, uh, you know, spirometry test, okay? And then, um, again, men versus women, it's a little bit different, and FVC just means it's a forced vital capacity maneuver. Tidal volume is a gas that's expired during this unforced or quiet breathing, ranges between 0.4 to 0.7 uh, liters or 500 milliliters, and there's an easier way to kind of remember that as well. Um, and it's just a normal breath out. Minute ventilation is typically assessed during a cardiopulmonary exercise test, um, and that is the tidal volume times the respiratory rate, and that's, you know, for most people in a minute, they're going to be moving about four liters per minute um, out of their lungs. And then residual volume is the air remaining in the lungs, Again, after a maximum expiration, it's roughly about a liter that stays behind. Again, mentioning again, that's usually a good bit of nitrogen. Remember, nitrogen is not something that um, you know, in, you know, it participates in gas exchange, and it's inert gas, and it helps keep the airways uh, open. Again, it's comprising about seventy-eight percent of the air we breathe in. And then uh, the other values we'll get from uh, spirometry, and again, this is typically more. Um, some of these are more you're going to get in a. Uh, plasmography, but inspiratory res reserve volume, expiratory reserve volume, functional residual capacity, MVV, we'll talk about that one, and diffusion capacity. So inspiratory reserve volume is basically the, you know, the, the reserve you have of inspiration, so how much more you could take in following a normal breath in. Expiratory reserve volume it would just be the opposite. How much more can you breathe out after a normal breath out or a tidal breath? And then functional residual capacity is that is the volume in the lungs after a normal breath. So it's not the residual capacity, which is you know the volume of air remaining in the lungs after we fully empty it. Functional res residual capacity is the amount of air after you breathe a tidal breath. It's that equilibrium point, remembering again at the end of expiration when the, the recoil of the lung which pulls in and the recoil of the chest which pulls out are in balance. And the volume that remains in the lung at that point um, is the functional residual capacity. It's, we, it's the set point we go back to after a normal 
rep. This will be decreased in patients with obesity, remembering that, that they have you know, that truncal fat, which compresses the chest wall. There can be other things that shift the FRC, but uh, that's, uh, again, the equilibrium point after a normal breath when the forces of the lung, which pulls in, and the forces of the chest, which pull out, are at balance. And that's the starting point, the volume we start at to breathe in a normal breath. Um, if it's decreased below normal, it makes it harder for us to breathe. A maximal voluntary ventilation um, is the total amount of air you can move after 12 seconds of maximal breathing. Now, this is done typically before a cardiopulmonary exercise test. Remember we talked about how you very, you very rarely get to, um, you know, you, you, you have an incredible reserve for breathing. We very, our lungs very rarely fail us. This is a way for us to see if that happens during exercise. Typically during exercise, your peak minute ventilation, remember we've said is tidal volume, times respiratory rate. During exercise, your peak men minute ventilation or your VE max, okay, this is at maximal intensity, should never be more than 80%, right, of your MVV. So if people start dipping into that, so say if they're getting up to, you know, 85% of their MVV, Say if they're getting you know up to 85% of that, means they're dipping more into what they're reserving. That's not a good sign. And again, that mean maybe there's some sort of ventilatory inefficiency there. And then there's diffusion capacity, right? So all of these values are looking just at ventilation. Remember, breathing is is both respir is respiration and ventilation. So ventilation again is moving air in and out of lungs. Diffusion or respiration is, is the diffusion of gases across the alveolar capillary interface. So breathing again, ventilation, movement of air, and respiration, diffusion of gases across the alveolar capillary interface. For us to assess how well that part of breathing is working, we infuse a patient with a known volume of carbon monoxide, CO. So if we know the known volume and know that carbon monoxide very easily um, is uptaken, right? It's got a very high affinity for um, hemoglobin or hemoglobin has a very high affinity for carbon monoxide, which is partly surely why it's so poisonous. It blocks bonding to other, other gases. Um, so if we you know, infuse a patient or have them breathe in a known volume or concentration of carbon monoxide, we would expect that the overwhelming majority of that will be uptaken, so we can assess how, how much is breathed out eventually. Um, we should expect that to be about 80% uptaken, or 80% of the predicted value. So how much we've given, they should get about 80% of that. So we can look at that to compare whether something's an intrinsic or an extrinsic disease, remembering you know, that obesity example. They're gonna have a restrictive defect in their lungs. We'll go over what that means in a bit. Um, but their diffusion capacity will be normal. So ventilation will be impaired, but respiration won't be. Same thing with asthma. They might show an obstructive defect, but they will have normal D DLCO because diffusion is typically not impaired in a patient with asthma. Um, whereas in COPD or idiopathic pulmonary fibrosis, intrinsic you know, pulmonary disorders that are not reversible, like their DLCO will be impaired as well in addition to the defects we see in ventilation. Now, looking at this plot here, this just shows again um, what these lung volumes correspond to. Again, tidal volume is just normal you know, normal breaths. Um, and typically before we have a patient perform a spirometry test, they take four normal breaths, and then they take a deep breath in, breathe all the way in, all the way in, all the way in, and then they breathe out as much as they possibly can, and then take a couple you know, breaths you know, before removing the device. And again, the vital capacity is that measure again from a full inspiration to a full expiration and that's you know again how much air can we move out of our lungs if we have our plasmography our plasmography we can then you know get a measure of residual volume because we'll know the volume of air that the patient is sitting in in the chamber and we can assess how much was moved out when they breathe into the tube and we can determine how much air is likely remaining in the lungs um, then we again have our total lung capacity, which basically would be this volume plus this volume equals how much air can possibly fit in the lungs. Um, again, in patients with um, a restrictive disorder, this will typically decrease. In patients with an obstructive disorder, this will typically increase. 
expiratory reserve res, uh, reserve volume again is how much more air we can take in after a normal breath. Expiratory reserve volume is how much you know air we can breathe out after a normal tightened breath. And that functional residual capacity again is the air remaining in the lungs you know after a normal tidal breath, right? Again, so those forces are at equilibrium. And again, just looking at uh, diffusion capacity, which again is the, you know, we, we can set in a very known concentration of carbon, carbon monoxide, which we know has an incredibly high affinity um, in our body. We, we bond to it really quickly, and we would expect that 80 to 100% of that would be uptaken if we have normal diffusion uh, capacity. If it's impaired, like which could be in someone who's got, you know, uh, volume, you know, breathing in problems, pulmonary blood flow problems, you know, reductions in alveolar capillary surface in, um, area, like we see in COPD, reductions in hemoglobin, like in anemia, or thickness of the alveolar capillary membrane that we see potentially in someone with, you know, scarring or fibrosis. Now, typically we normalize the DLCO to alveolar volume because the alveolar volume will be a little bit higher um, in patients with um, COPD. So we can throw in a, um, you can throw a wrench in our assessments. It may look like it's falsely decreased. So we want to make sure that we normalize it to alveolar volume. So you might see in a chart, um, DLCO VA, and that just means that's been normalized to alveolar volume. Now, the other part of the assessment that we'll look at when looking at PFTs is the flow volume loop. And again, remembering that this begins at the intersection of the um, X axis and Y axis. And actually, just to keep this a little bit shorter, what we might even do here is I think we'll pause. And then we'll come back to looking at some of those uh, specific values. So we'll pause here, and then um, just to make it simpler, we will, uh, you know, we'll come back and do a, another video on on these specific uh, values.